Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever ID Founder Ask Me Anything webinar. Uh, I could not be more happy to be a part of Immaculate Dissection, which we call ID, uh, and, and these incredible people that I'm about to introduce. Uh, I'm Dr. Kathy Dooley. I'm one of the co-founders and so excited to, uh, to be here. Uh, chiropractic rehab specialist, uh, as well as uh, uh, anatomy enthusiast, <laughs> uh, teaching anatomy for a couple of universities, but most importantly, teaching functional anatomy and assessment with immaculate dissection. Um, gotta introduce you to Dr. Anna Folkmer. Dr. Anna Folkmer, take the floor. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Anna Falkmer. I'm also one of the co-founders of Immaculate Dissection. Um, I'm an acupuncturist and an herbalist, and I also am an anatomy instructor in uh, a couple of different schools as well. So, and then of course, love teaching functional anatomy and assessment for Immaculate Dissection. She is amazing. If you're lucky enough to be taught by her, then you are definitely going to increase your skill sets. Uh, we're so happy that she co-founded the company with us. And then not to, to, to leave you last, but definitely you're amazing and deserve a, a, an amazing attention to the anatomic artist for macro dissection, Danny Quirk, co-founder. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Danny. I'm the uh, the artist for Immaculate Dissection. So do a series of body paintings, uh, artwork for the manuals, and then just create uh, anatomic visuals that help complement and visualize what uh, Anna and Kathy teach. So, <laughs> and he's great at it. Uh, so we wanted to do a webinar with the three co-founders to answer some questions from the amazing idealist family, as well as uh, some of the people that are considering immaculate dissection work or people that just are anatomy enthusiasts and want to ask people with a penchant for anatomy how, how we do things at ID. Uh, we took some great questions from some people online. Uh, I, I'd love to start with someone who came live with us, uh, uh, amazing Gurinder from the UK, uh, staying up late to join us. <laughs> uh, we would definitely want to, to answer his question first and foremost since he came on with us uh, in a live capacity. So I um, want to cover his question here. So his question is the following. I've heard the diaphragm being described as the only skeletal muscle that can be used to consciously control the function of an organ, i.e. the brain through breath work as if it's an extension of the brain. Um, firstly, your insight into the neurophysiological basis of this will be great. Secondly, he's been wondering whether there were any other skeletal muscles in the body that are capable of this conscious control. What an awesome question. And we cover this in ID1 and ID6. Uh, ID1 is uh, core concepts. So we cover the diaphragm, Dr. Anna Folkmer, uh, describes this in very big detail in about an hour long lecture, uh, functional anatomy lecture as well as palpation. And then Danny paints it on himself, which is something to, to definitely see either on the online courses or in person. It's, it's, a, it's a real treat. Uh, I can't imagine painting anything on myself. <laughs> <laughs> thoracic diaphragm is incredible and um we do have a, a copy of the manual here so i just want to do a screen share and talk about this a little bit more and then uh all of us can chime in and i'll share a piece and maybe dr folkmer and uh and danny you can cover some pieces as well and so just taking a look here at, at danny's incredible artwork you guys can see that yes uh can you scroll up we've just uh, there we go okay great making sure awesome so uh this is danny's uh actual painting on uh what looks like a female here and uh it is uh not just a rendering but something that danny has painted on the person which i think is, is an incredible feat uh and the, the thoracic diaphragm is a very special structure as you're alluding to Gurinder. you the rumors you have heard are very true the, the thoracic diaphragm is uh, somatically innervated, for sure. It's innervated by the phrenic nerve. You guys have probably heard the mnemonic C3, C4, C5, keep the diaphragm alive, yes? And uh, I love when Dr. Folkmer talks about that in the coursework. And uh, what's very special about the thoracic diaphragm is that it also, because it is covered with parietal pleura and uh, parietal peritoneum, which is connective tissue, it has visceral afferents from vagus, who also supplies the parasympathetics for the foregut and midgut, uh, so basically the, the beginnings of digestion, as well as your uh, esophageal contra contractions, 
and your breathing rate lowering and your heart rate lowering. This is vagal control. And the, the diaphragm has a feedback mechanism through this visceral afferents through vagus, and that's brainstem oriented, right? Through this dorsal motor nucleus of vagus and also through a sensory nucleus for vagus. And because of that, you have enormous feedback into this reticular system and also through cardiorespiratory systems in the medulla, which is part of the brainstem that also innervates the, uh, all these gut structures, right? As well as the thorax for parasympathetics. And because of that, your diaphragm is modified gut. It is surrounding the esophagus. And, and if you guys take a look here, uh, there are these holes and then these arches that are created in the diaphragm that are allowing for hiatuses or spaces for these organs to pass through. And they include uh, the inferior vena cava through the central tendon, through uh, the, this midline one, which is gonna be for the aorta, and one that's off to the center a little bit to the left, which is the esophageal hiatus. And because of the passageway of organs or visceral structures and through diaphragmatic peritoneal and pleural attachments to organs, the diaphragm has a massive effect on organs of the thorax and organs of uh, the foregut and midgut for the abdomen. So all the rumors you heard, Gurinder, are very true. Uh, Dr. Anna, I, I want to come over to you because you mm -hmm. teach this lecture so, so well. And maybe you can talk about the way that we assess and correct this uh, in immaculate dissection. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, in immaculate dissection, and just like Kathy said, too, one of the wonderful things that I think Gurinder is, is alluding to in his question, but also that Kathy just touched on was that this structure uniquely receives autonomic and somatic innervation. So it's something that um, it'll, it'll keep doing, you know, it'll keep doing its thing every single day, 25,000 times a day from the minute we're born until the minute it's lights out. Um, but because we also have some sort of conscious control over it, it's, it is certainly worthy of our assessment. It's, it's, it's like, you know, arguably the most important thing in life that you're going to do, but because we have conscious control over it, um, we can sort of change the program a little bit for the autonomics. So it's, this is why we incorporate it into our assessment because it really is a nice um, sort of full body uh, uh, integrator in the fact that, you know, this, this separates the thorax from the abdomen. So the important structures that have to pass through there, um, if they are compromised because of some sort of diaphragmatic dysfunction, it may not be limited to just, you know, rib side discomfort or things like that. It might show up as uh, some sort of gastrointestinal um, symptomatology or some sort of blood uh, pathology, circulatory pathology or fluid metabolism. So, you know, we talk about this as part of our assessment and our clinical auditing process in immaculate dissection because this structure sort of is so unique, not only it's in its innervation, but in the way that it separates the two cavities and the structures that are going to pass through it. Um, it really does sort of bring everything together. And, um, and, and you know, I, I study Chinese medicine. That's like one of the things that I practice. And, and Chinese medicine sort of alludes to this too. These structures that are, um, or the points that are right around the, the costal margin and the rib cage there, where the diaphragm is actually uh, located anatomically, you see this sort of like, you know, just wonderful collection of functionality from these points where it can, you know, do everything from helping blood circulation to helping digestion to helping fluid metabolism. And all of the same things are echoed in these sort of ancient uh, techniques as well as in the functional anatomy. I mean, we, when we dissect this in the lab, you know, the cadavers that we receive were, are there because of cardiorespiratory failure. So this is, um, you know, a, a structure that's responsible for the first and last thing you do in life. And, and so much of that, you know, comes out in our day to day as well. Um, just with the, the regulatory effects that it has, not only the sort of major on and off bot button of the whole entire body, but the thing that keeps everything going throughout the day as well. Love it. Uh, Danny, do you have anything to add as far as things that you've learned and love to share at Immaculate Dissection about the thoracic diaphragm and its connection to these organs? Well, definitely learned some pretty interesting things just kind of through putting it through myself, through, through attending the seminars. 
a uh, lot of uh, Again, like as as uh, Kathy and Anna were saying, there's some major structures that pass through the diaphragm, like the esophagus, the uh, the aorta, the inferior vena cava. And being an artist, being in a relatively kind of hunched position a lot of times when I worked, you know, would uh, would definitely definitely had noticed like things that just kind of passed off as normal in myself. Uh, was able to realize, oh shit, that's coming from like bad posture. That's coming from bad positioning. So uh, so found that through learning how to, in essence, breathe more properly, how to kind of more more or less breathe more functionally and whatnot, a lot of these things kind of went away, like, uh, so some, I guess, kind of some examples being, like, you know, would have, like, a fierce bounding aortic pulse, you know, that was coming from the aorta <laughs> being choked off, that was having some, some pretty cold and blue feet from uh, inferior vena cava being, being pinched off and whatnot, and it was, it was just really cool, like, again, like, I'm not coming from, uh, from a background that Anna, or that Kathy and Anna are, but, uh, it's, it's really interesting, you know, learning the anatomy through them, drawing the anatomy, and then being able to put it into, the, put it into myself and realize, oh, this, this really checks out. This is, this is quite cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's a really important thing for us in Immaculate Dissection to look at these things called clinical pearls, where we look at how something has an effect that shows up with uh, empirical evidence over and over and over again in clinical practice. And it's not just about knowing some anatomy from a textbook, but applying it to the person that's in front of you and being able to recognize these organ effects. And Grinder's second part of his question was, uh, is there any other structure that's similar? I will tell you that uh, no, <laughs> not <laughs> quite like uh, what we call diaphragm number five, the thoracic diaphragm. But in Immaculate Dissection 6, which is the anatomy of movement subsystems, we do talk about the fact that there are seven diaphragms. We have seven. And uh, there is a harmony between midline, between these seven structures that do have visceral effects. Uh, and uh, we could talk more about that at a future webinar. But if you take ID6 with us, we, we spend a long time on the intrinsic core stabilization system in the sagittal plane, especially in midline, and, and talk about the fact that there are, are seven total diaphragms, not unlike having seven total chakras. So uh, we'll, we'll cover that more in depth in the future. So no, there aren't uh, as uh, structures that are diaphragmatic. There as much of an organ effect. Maybe the second closest would be diaphragma cellae covering uh, the uh, the pituitary, but that one is not under your control as much as the thoracic diaphragm is. You get to uh, to go back to what Danny was saying. You get to choose to change it, and Anna was saying that too. Like we work really hard to to change the autopilot on a lot of this stuff. So uh, fantastic question, Grinder. That was great. And Danny, you gave a nice segue into the next question that we were asked about posture. Mm -hmm. You were talking about uh, posture affecting uh, the breathing pattern. And uh, someone had asked us a, a question, uh, just to kind of uh, read their question. They, they were asking about how, how we cue postural positioning and how that can affect breathing. Which, basically what you had said. <laughs> yeah. So I love that you uh, kind of segued into that. And uh, I wanted to pull up a share of uh, something we do in, in immaculate dissection uh, called prone breathing. And so I'll move to that now. And okay, so let's go to a share on that so I can show you guys a little bit. And this in regards to prone breathing, uh, we just posted this uh, a few days ago, and you'll see that we do something called crocodile breathing. We do this in every single immaculate dissection course, and you'll notice that we're cueing people not to collapse the spine, and then we give people uh, these cues that are basically um, neck long, chin tuck, chest wide, ribs down, and we're, we're cueing them to have nice, long, controlled exhales, and this is an important piece. Uh, for us to be able to to coach uh, spinal cueing. Sorry, as I'm having technical difficulties with the video, Anna, you had something that was brought up by an idealist or a patient? Yeah, yeah, from an idealist. So one of our idealists actually today sent me a, um, a, a link to one of her classes that she was teaching that was sort of a yoga movement hybrid class. And she said, hey, you know, sending this just in case you want to check it out. And, um, and, and to see how she had incorporated the, the cues of the neck long chin back chest wide rib sound and everything that you know we're going to talk about for just setting you up for basic success of, of 
spinal stability and intra-abdominal pressure building. Um, to see the way that she had integrated that into her class was absolutely beautiful. And, and just, you know, taking something that's so tried and true, like uh, these beautiful yoga practices and stuff that a lot of our attendees have, and just refining it even more to where we can start to kind of key into that um, uh, you know, the, some of the IDQs as well and, and, you know, that effect that we have on the diaphragm and the effect that we have on pelvic stability and spinal neutrality and, and intra-abdominal pressure uh, building and, and management was just really, really awesome to see. So Awesome. Yeah, it was great. Very cool. Let's see if uh, my technical difficulties have declined here. Let's see. Uh, we had posted a video earlier this week with some of the cues and there we go, the video is working a little bit better now. And so we're just coaching prone breathing and just to kind of fast forward here, you can see us go through uh, several of the cues and it, it basically, ID cues for us are neck long and back and chin tucked to keep your cervical lordosis, uh, chest wide in front with the ribs down. And we're making sure to breathe laterally to the sides of the ribs so that the rest of the spine can kind of relax into holding up their lordotic or kyphotic curves based upon uh, creating this S shape in the sagittal plane that's so crucial to uh, the proper loading and shock absorption of the spine and, and kind of buttressing against the axial compressive loads of gravity. And so breathing to us is a crucial piece and posture cues for us, for us are very crucial. And uh, you'll, you'll see the ID cues coming across the screen here with the breathing. This is just a basic prone breathing drill, but a lot of people, you'll see a lot of YouTube videos <laughs> that are uh, not exactly safe mm -hmm. in, in prone breathing because they're not load share. And so for us at Immaculate Dissection, we're always talking about load share. We don't use the word posture because that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And, and posture can mean like they squeeze their shoulder blades together in the back, which takes you out of thoracic kyphosis, which then decreases the amount of curve that you have to buttress again that axial compressive load and it increases some neck tension for people when they squeeze their shoulder blades together in the back. Uh, lots of things that now, may not go well. So, so basically we don't use the word posture in immaculate dissection, we use the terms load share because what that means is that you're sharing load across something to maintain safety. And uh, posture, a lot for a lot of our patients that we, we talk about uh, our renewed idealists uh, that, that come in to see us for appointments, we, we know that posture can mean a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily safe for the patient in front of us. So to keep the neck, back, shoulders, uh, thorax, abdomen, all coordinated, we do load shared tests and load shared cues, which we call IDQs. And so um, you'll hear us repeat that in every single immaculate dissection that you take, whether one, two, three, four, five, six, any of them, you're going to hear neck long and back, chin back, chest wide, ribs down, hips even. And, and that's just relative to each other to maintain this load share, aka posture. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that covers that question pretty well. Um, anything you guys want to add about posture? Um, the IDQs kind of go one step beyond posture. Like it, it, it adds a uniformity to it because these are cues that can be well defended from this place of, you know, why they set you up from, for success. And there's, there's really no argument about it at all. So it, it takes the word posture, which a lot of people throw around. And I think it, like you said, it means something different to different people. And it just, it ties it all together in this sort of very uniform way of like, when we say, you know, load share, or if somebody's implying posture through that, this is exactly what we mean. And this is exactly what you should aim to find in your movements. So I, I think it really does sort of go above and beyond what just the word posture means to somebody. Wonderful, Anna. Danny, do you have anything to add to that? I know you had, you had talked about it earlier, but your yeah, no, it, improved so much, Danny, since I've known oh, you. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's crazy feeling the difference. And it just kind of makes me think of like, I don't know, you see all those kind of those failed gym, those uh, failed gym videos where people are replicating movements, but not doing things properly. So if you can kind of think of posture as replicating that movement, whereas load share is doing it properly. So love, love and it. that, and that right there is just really going to like, Again, for me, like that, that's where I really felt the difference was when properly load shared versus like replicated movement. So I really like that because uh, people tell me, well, my trainer or my chiropractor told me to do it. My physical therapist told me to do this cue. I just had a, a telehealth visit today with a patient 
where uh, their physiotherapist had told them to squeeze their shoulder blades together in the back when they were doing something. And she noticed that she would get this increase in neck tension. And, uh, and so she was just doing what she was told. And it was with good intention. The person mm -hmm. had very, very good intentions, but that cue was not right for that person and meant that she may have a certain posture that the person was looking for, but it was not load share for the client in front of them. So I love that you guys brought that point up. That, that was just fantastic. Um, another question um, that was given to us was uh, the hip flexor tightness hmm. and why hip flexor stretches don't work that well, or at least don't last. And I know that Dr. Falkmore has a lot to say about this because she teaches <laughs> the rectus femoris iliacus, but before you do, Anna, let me, let me pull up the gorgeous picture from Danny again, from our manual. Uh, to get our manuals, folks, you have to come in a live capacity, but uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic, beautiful picture here where you can see a couple of important things. Uh, can you guys see this okay? Yep. Okay, so the psoas here and iliacus here, which are some of your prime things to function when the hip is flexing. And you can see that there are two separate muscles going underneath this inguinal ligament that's created by the external abdominal oblique, and they're coming down to insert onto the lesser trochanter, yes? Well, the important thing that we teach about in immaculate dissection is that a lot of what's cueing this action to happen is the iliopsoas fascia that's covering these that's connected to this anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia and this thing called the conjoint tendon, which is the junction of this internal abdominal oblique you see here and the transversus abdominis here. And so those two things are coming together to then uh, basically connect to the iliopsoas fascia and cue it to bring the knee towards the chest. So if someone has an improper intra-abdominal pressure building through these important structures, like TVA and IAO, then you're gonna false cue the ability to flex the hip. And you might even go into an anterior pelvic tilt or go into thoracolumbar extension. And then you'll feel an eccentric pulling on the front of the leg. But that does not mean that you're doing quality eccentric uh, control of the psoas and iliacus muscles. So uh, Dr. Anna, would you like to piggyback on that for uh, what you teach in uh, the course as far as uh, rectus femoris and, and iliacus? Yeah, so um, I, I think one of the, the best things about pairing up, you know, the functional anatomy with the assessment process is that it ensures that your problem solving strategy or your answer to the problem actually matches the problem that is sort of in front of you. So hip flexor tightness um, what does that even mean? Our assessment tells you exactly what that means. And before you go just trying to stretch out something because you have the awareness of tightness there, it gives you some insight as to what does that tightness mean? Why is that tightness there? And then what to do about it? Because that hip tightness, you know, it's, it's so great to, to see that hip tightness completely dissipate when we put somebody in supine 9090, for example, right. which has, you know, that's a hip flexed state. So, um, you know, the, and I think that that's why when people go into sort of their typical versions of what a hip flexor stretch looks like, um, it's not actually taking them out of the position. It's, it's, you're moving the, the mobile point in a lot of these versions of hip flexor stretches is not in fact at the hip. It's at the spine. And so then you're compromising something that, you know, probably was already a little bit vulnerable and then transferring that sort of awareness into the front of the hip. And so, um, you know, just kind of helping with a little bit of myth busting from a place of problem solving strategy, um, you know, the assessment and then the answer to that assessment is what's really great about, um, you know, the, the hip flexor, um, positions that we put people in because, you know, it, that always blows people in the mind when, you know, they're in a hip flex state and they're not feeling anything because they're actually queued up properly. So, you know, understanding what that actually means and how to sort of interpret, well, what is tightness actually? Well, we know tightness to mean dysfunction. Why is it dysfunctional? Is it actually 
the site of dysfunction or, or is it the source of the dysfunction um, and how to sort of hash that out a little bit. I had a, a patient the other day that told me that she was taking an online class and all of their ab exercises were just turning into, you know, hip flex or like awareness. And she was like, I don't think this is right. I don't think this is the goal of this. And I was like, I think you're correct too. So let's <laughs> figure that out. And, Not the um, idealist. Yes. Yes. I love it. I love, yeah. I love when people finally realize that just because they feel something, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Like you can put yourself into what feels like a hip flexor stretch. Yeah. Like, are you even stretching it because it's tight? And, and, and Dana, uh, and Anna alluded to something that, that Danny and Anna and I uh, basically teach at ID, which is tight equals dysfunction and worthy of your assessment. It doesn't mean that the person needs to stretch. And that is what our, our patients and our, our students even have a really hard time with it first because they think, oh, it's tight, therefore I need to stretch it. No, maybe it's tight because it's already on stretch. Right. Maybe your body has created tonicity in the tissue to decelerate it from moving further into a position. And that is a very, very important piece. Uh, functional tissue is not tight, right? It doesn't, doesn't usually need to just be stretched. Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna let us piggyback into the, to the next question on concentric versus eccentric loading. Uh, and, but before we, we do that, Danny, do you have anything to add about um, the stretch thing? And the, 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 the big thing that I would add just in terms of that much though is uh, just because, you know, say for instance, it's hurting in the hip flexor region and whatnot, you know, and it's, it's tight and it's functional and, and, or feeling tightness in that area. Um, if, you, if you initially go in and just start stretching in that area, it could be a matter of uh, addressing a symptom versus addressing a cause. You so, through, so through the seminars, you know, through our standard operating systems, through how we kind of teach from the core outwards and whatnot, uh, you can really kind of learn how to pinpoint like, like where to really look first and how a lot of these issues are more trickle down problems afterwards. I love it. I love it. We, we talk a lot in ID about the trickle down effect. The fact that if your hip flexor is tight, the first place you don't go is the hip flexor. Yeah. <laughs> if the hip flexor is tight. The first thing we go to in immaculate dissection is, is the core, because as we just talked about earlier, the transverse abdominis, internal abdominal oblique, anterior layer, thoracic lumbar fascia can be the reason why the hip flexor is tight. And it, it's that pull, that, that yank, and that if you build blood pressure, you might actually get the hip flexors to relax by being in hip flexion, mm -hmm. which is not a hard sell. When you concentrically shorten something with proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, PNF, which shows up over and over in research as being very effective to reduce tension in a muscle. What do you do to that first in PNF? What does every PNF book on the planet talk about, especially the PNF book called Proprioceptive Neuromuscular Facilitation? It talks about shortening a muscle and then lengthening it because shortening it reduces the tension into something, and then you lengthen it. You have permission to move into that space. And so um, it's always shocking to my patients when I say, can you stop doing your hip flexor stretch? And they're like, what? But I feel something. I feel something. I'm like, just because you feel something doesn't mean jack. So in immaculate dissection, we use, like as Danny talked about, a standard operating system, especially for the hip flexor region, first to clear someone of a core stability problem. And then Anna does this wonderful job of teaching about uh, two of the major hip flexors, iliacus and rectum, and, uh, and so as, and then as we go into the adductors who also function in hip flexion, TFL sartorius who function in hip flexion, you got a lot of work to do to find out who is tight, why they're tight, before you just globally stretch something and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Because with a lot of, of my patients in the past, they've done a lot of hip flexor stretching that may have bought them time, I guess, because of sensory input but just destabilize them more out of their femorally centrated or core stable position at the pelvis. And so I, I wish there were an easy answer for this, but it really comes to where do I start at the flow chart? And so in immaculate dissection, we have a standard operating system at each course uh, where we have a flow chart that you follow. And if you follow it, you're not confused. As complicated as anatomy can be, we've, we've really streamlined it to where if you follow an ID flow, you're gonna be very, very close to the primary problem for that person on that visit without having to guess. And that, I don't know, will give you the confidence as a practitioner or a trainer to then give your client confidence for them to be able to execute with empowerment that they are on the, the right structure, they're on uh, the right path. 
towards doing something that, that changes the way that they feel, especially if it's nociceptive. Well, and that, that confidence too comes from the fact that the, I, the ID assessment, the ID flow charts are the thing that will grant you permission to do, you know, whatever corrective is necessary without speeding through any of those yellow lights. And, and, you know, I always, whenever I have a patient that comes to me and they're, they're showing me what they're doing and basically telling me what they're doing isn't working and they're wondering why, you know, I sort of have this running joke with a lot of them that they're, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. So <laughs> maybe that hip flexor awareness doesn't require hip flexor stretch. And, you know, that the confidence that comes from these ID assessments and the flow chart is what ultimately grants you that permission to be able to do, you know, what you need to do to get to the source of the problem. Absolutely. And uh, with such good timing for this question, I have filmed a video on this ex exact topic, kind of like a, a two minute version of what we, we teach for several hours in Immaculate Dissection 2 about how to properly do a hip flexor stretch. Although we don't use these things called stretches in ID, we th use things called pendulums that we'll discuss later. Uh, we, we don't even use the word stretch in Immaculate Dissection. We use the word coordinate because we got to get people away from thinking stretching serves them a purpose because I've read the research and isometric stretching makes you weaker. It makes our athletes weaker. It does not make them more powerful, more resilient. It, uh, the, the evidence is mounting away from, from doing static stretching and, and pendular movements that we discussed in ID, which is a movement kind of like PNF moving in and out of, of someone's doable range with, with controlled articulation. It, it is, uh, what we use for changing the anatomy right in front of the person, which is so empowering for both the practitioner slash trainer, as well as the person in front of them, the client. So on that, piggybacking on that, uh, someone asked us a question about uh, how do you best uh, strengthen tissue? Do you strengthen it at ID with concentric, eccentric, or mm -hmm. isometric holds? And of course, our answer, all three of the co-founders are going to answer all of the above. Yeah. And so we use uh, our flow charts, our assessment flow charts to know why we're at where we're at. And then once we know why we're at where we're at, we ask these clinical um, auditing process questions, which we call clinical pearls. And then if we're lucky enough to have the person in person <laughs> and not on telehealth, then we, we do palpations. And we love to teach palpation because we want someone to understand the difference between tightness and a pain, which is different. And as we educate our clients and educate our students on that difference, uh, we, we stay in areas that have this, this tight bound structure that's normally attempting to decelerate itself through a neurological pattern. So neurological tightness, which is different than fibrosis, right? Uh, scarring. It's different. It's it's a, a parking brake that you place on place on tissues so that they don't go into an area of perceived threat. It's not unlike putting a parking brake on a car. Maybe your tissues are tight because they have to be because it's a necessary thing. So before we do anything in ID, uh, concentric, eccentric, anything, we do an evaluation process, a standard operating system, a flow chart, and uh, after we we initiate where we should be and evaluate where we should be, then we do these movements we call pendulums. And we move the person back and forth through the range of the tissue. And we watch, the ID cues are always maintained, right? And we're watching the tissue change in a small reduced range that they can control, not dissimilar to a controlled articulation, only just with more evaluation behind it. And, uh, and it's a beautiful process of, of watching the combination of PNF theory with joint centration theory. And that's both concentric and eccentric patterns of the tissue. And we call it meeting someone where they're at and taking them where they're not, just like a pendulum. And as, as the pendulum starts to swing a little bit more under controlled movement with the ID cues matched, then we can actually get the tissue to change very fast. And we can then assign that to a client for them to do on their own when they feel tightness start. So the tightness becomes not something they need to stretch out, but something they need to assess for themselves. So we teach our clients how to assess for themselves, which is very powerful. 
And uh, then we, of course, include isometrics because that's what builds strength the fastest. And so uh, like for the lower extremity, we use uh, half kneeling progressions to, to do a lot of uh, stability control in an isometric pattern. And then we move that on to parts of the, the getup, which is a neural developmental sequence. Uh, we, in ID3, which is the upper extremity course, we do a static uh, positioning like arm bars where we're uh, doing a, a controlled isometric position and then we can add in isokinetics but we're first making sure that the isokinetic position or isometric position is very stable and, and it's load shared through our three major joints of the shoulder that we're most concerned with in immaculate dissection part three. Uh, and, and in each of the immaculate dissections we're, we're focusing on a region typically with the exception of five and six, which are nerves and, and global systems. But uh, for ID one, two, three, and four, we're very focused on uh, marrying concentric, eccentric abilities, the range of a, a tissue to be able to go through a doable range with control and with spinal cues uh, maintained. Uh, Anna, do you wanna comment any more on concentric, eccentric and uh, the, the iso, isometrics for strength? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if somebody, well, first of all, I mean, if somebody can't maintain their cues in that isometric position, like you don't have the permission to try to move them in and out of the concentric and eccentric load. So, um, you know, the, the point, like you, you, you mentioned the um, recordin like the coordinating of tissues. And I love that so much because it really sort of shifts gears into what the actual goal is, which is just the restoration of functionality. And so you're able to sort of play with a concentric and eccentric range that, you know, it doesn't have to be this crazy range. I mean, and that's one of the things that we explore with the pendulums is where can that person sort of safely move through space without compromising anything. And we have little perturbation tests in some of the isometric positions as well, like the half kneeling, where we'll, you know, we'll see what happens when they try to balance or something like that. And, and, and so ultimately it's about giving something, uh, giving something prescriptive to our clients and patients that um, matches our assessment, but also teaching them the self-assessment part so that what their answer to their problem is, is appropriate for them because your pendulum and my pendulum might look different. And, you know, we might have different points of contact that are the most vulnerable or, or you know, the areas of weakness. Um, we might have a different cue that we miss, you know, that we start to lose first and foremost before we try to even go into that range of motion. So um, it is this like really beautiful trifecta of, of maintaining your cues within a certain isometric position and then playing with a range of motion too that is appropriate for that patient based on our assessment. And I love, I love that you said that because uh, what we look for in immaculate dissection are things that are like locked long and locked short, meaning to us like this, this thing is biasing towards like a shorter long position. And then to meet them where they're at neurologically in that shorter long position and then to take them where they're not within a range that they can control that changes the, the brain in a way that if there's neurological tightness behind the tissue, it dissipates so fast. I've seen people hold a static stretch for like, a, like 10 minutes before when I can get that same tissue to, to down-regulate in tension in, in three reps of pendulum. Yeah. Then it becomes time managed. It's hard enough to get people to do corrective strategy with, with discipline, but if I can tell them they can do it in a couple reps versus needing to have 20 minutes in the morning, the likelihood of them being compliant exponentially increases the more effective that you can be. And not, not that we're just into fast at ID. We want effective and quick and compliant and something that can be repeatable. And, and that's a crucial piece. So uh, we're very proud to know at ID that all of our courses are recorded. And uh, I think that what's so fascinating about the idealists, and maybe the co-founders can, can chime in, I find that the people in our course that struggle with pendulums the most, if, if they're willing to, to break within themselves the things that they're discrepant in, they have discrepancy in, then they're the ones that become our teaching team members. They're like the ones that are like non-negotiable. Uh, I see that Karen's on the call. I want to see if maybe I can unmute her. Karen, are you still there? Did she leave? Oh, shoot. She left. Um, but I wanted to, because she, she's such a, 
uh, highlight it in someone who really has a ton of discipline. And, and for her, like learning anatomy was putting it into her own body. And then she could share it with her clients, which is a huge piece for us. And we always are encouraging immaculate dissection is, can you put this into your own body? And so going through that, that the concentric, eccentric, ISO, it, it is a combination of all three being very crucial to us in ID. So it's not, it's not this or that, it's all. And, and there is like a meeting people where they're at always. Well, your success rate just goes through the roof, right? When you meet somebody where they are. I mean, there is, you know, there, there's, it, it, like you said, it's not about selling somebody on an idea, but like, it, I, I think that so many people have come to us with these experiences of someone just saying, you know, oh, well, oh, were you, were you doing that? Well, just don't do that anymore. Or that's essentially what your prescriptive exercise is saying. Like, you know, you're, it's about reinventing this whole entire motor pattern in your body that um, without any regards to where the person is and why they, why, why or how they got there. And so this idea of meeting somebody in that dysfunction and then teaching them how to, to come out of it um, does just ultimately make you more successful just in terms of your prescriptive um, exercise strategies. There's but also as a, as a clinical teacher too. Absolutely. Danny, do you have anything to add as far as um, uh, an ID, the way that we teach concentric versus eccentric versus uh, isometrics? Yeah, no, what I was going to add in on that, though, was just basically like uh, what the seminar does a really wonderful job and what, you know, you guys do a really wonderful job at doing is just uh, you're not just telling people uh, do this. You're telling you're telling the what, the how and the why. And I, I, I think the why really drives the point back home right there, because like if you're, you're not just replicating something, you're not just doing anything, you're creating these pathways in your brain that allow for tissues and structures to feel safe, to move, to move confidently, which will allow for it to build strength, which will allow for it to, you know, just, just, just not be dysfunctional tissue anymore. So by, by building those, those neurological pathways, uh, putting a muscle through its full range of motion, as opposed to just where it's limited to, is really going to do a world of wonders for getting out of that dysfunction and moving on a more stable platform. Love it. Uh, I, I mean, I've seen people in commercial gyms, like their mobility workout lasts longer than my workout does. Mm -hmm. And that's when you got to start to ask yourself, did you evolve after 3.8 billion years past all the quadrupeds to, to spend 45 minutes trying to mobilize your tissue? Come on, come, come now. Now a kangaroo is a biped. They don't need to, to go through all of this. What, why in the world? do homo sapiens do because their cerebrum gets in the way and immaculate dissection as cerebral as we are and as much as we want to understand the why things are the way they are it comes down to the homework being simple and concise and patient oriented and and knowing where to start and knowing that it, it it doesn't take too long to do it and i think that people are so married to the more they do the better off they are and in the great words of brett jones more is not better better is better I do think that ID takes whatever you're doing, whether it doesn't matter what your certification is, your alphabet soup of certs. <laughs> ID makes it faster, efficient. It hits the, the nail on the head every time. And, and I know because I can do in 45 minutes what, what some people, it takes them five or six visits to do. Because I have a standard operating system, and I follow it, and I trust it. So um, awesome input. I love it, guys. Um, one of my favorite questions that I saw that gets asked a lot, um, why can't I stretch the piriformis all the time? Because, <laughs> uh, Danny, you had done this gorgeous animation this week. Well, thank you. It, it, it's phenomenal. And I want to show everybody, hopefully I won't, you know, break the internet again. I'm just going to go to screen share and show this absolutely phenomenal animation by Danny here. I just got to find it, folks. And duly, you're failing miserably. There we go. And so this is Danny's animation. You guys can see it, yes? Yeah. And, oh, it does it every time. So, sorry, guys. Uh, it's not showing up in the way that I like. Um, but, okay, so let's see if I can upload that again. And can you guys see this okay? Yeah. Okay. So just going through the video that Danny posted this week, it is just gorgeous. He shows the greater static notch through which piriformis passes. And then he shows that the neurovascular bundles that go through like sciatic nerve, a superior and inferior gluteal nerve artery and vein, 
uh, the pudendal nerve uh, and its uh, internal pudendal artery and vein, these massive neurovascular structures here. Look at all of this. And it's not just piriformis, it's a tiny little tissue piece. Not all that's here. Um, there's so many neurovascular structures. And uh, just to stop the share for a second, uh, Danny, you did such a gorgeous depiction of this because in the immaculate dissection, we're trying to get you to just stop rolling your butt out all the time. <laughs> stop home rolling your butt. And not everything in your butt is piriformis. In fact, very little is. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree that the, the bulk of what's going through the the greater sciatic notch is definitely the piriformis uh, tendon going over the small part of its belly and the tendon going over to the greater trochanter area. But come, come now, you've got some major neurovascular bundles, four neurovascular bundles, including a couple extra pieces uh, in that area. I mean, one of them's affecting your perineum for crying out loud and your external anal sphincter <laughs> and your ability to, you know, get an erection and, and to, to, you know, engorge even the female tissues, as well as centrate the femur. Come on now, superior gluteal, nerve artery and vein that go through that same hole, they control the gluteus medius minimus TFL. And the most recent research article I read was that there is no nerve to piriformis, that they think that the vast majority of piriformis muscles are innervated by the superior gluteal nerve, which means that same tissue that you're compressing with the ball or foam roller, or that you're trying to stretch out all the time, do nerves like to be stretched? Last time I checked, they don't. And if you start stretching out nerves, they get the area around that area gets very tense, very tight. You start compressing neurovascular structures, especially vascular structures, and now you're impeding upon the circulation of the tissue. And do you really want to shut down the nerve artery and vein supply to the tissues that centrate the femur? And so I'll admit to the gallery of humans on this planet that I used to be that person that foam rolled her butt cheek for 45 minutes before going underneath a bar for a deadlift or a squat. And I don't touch my butt cheek anymore because I know better. Because the way that I finally was able to get tension out of the piriformis or the grand schema of things that are in your butt, as you just saw in Danny's gorgeous art, it is crucial to know why that area is tight, and it could be a number of things. You have 10 structures back there that are muscles alone trying to centrate the femur in its socket, and then you have the neurovascular bundles to all of those. Do you really, really want to be compressing those tissues? I mean, I don't like to step on the garden hose before I water it, but that's essentially what you're doing. So you got to be really careful. If something's tight, it is worthy of your attention. It's worthy of your attention, and the stretch may not be that noteworthy for you. It may buy you some time, might even encourage the circulation a little bit, but it also may create neurovascular compression of all these tissues that you just saw on that, on that video. That video is, is seen in our Immaculate Dissection Facebook page, and that video is also seen in our Immaculate Dissection Instagram, and I'm also uploading it this week to our ID2 Vimeos. Uh, all of our courses are recorded, so we, our, our students, either online or in person, can go back and watch everything as many times as they want, just indefinitely. Because um, it's important to repeat, 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 repeat over and over and over. Uh, and, uh, but we really want to stop everyone from believing that everything in their butt is piriformis, and that, that in the great words of Greg Cook, if the foam roller hasn't fixed it by now, it probably never will. You yeah. need to assess. Anna, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, piriformis assessment and, and, yeah. and why we don't just dig into the butt cheek all the time? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's acupuncture points there too, and I, I don't put needles into that tissue because, um, you know, I think that for a lot of people, the thing that's prompting this um, uh, foam rolling and sitting on a lacrosse ball or whatever is just a sensation or an awareness without really knowing why, I mean, why it feels the way that it feels. And, and there, you, we see this clinically all the time, right? That, that hamster wheel of the thing that somebody's doing because they have awareness is also just increasing the awareness. And so helping someone get off that hamster wheel so that you're breaking that cycle is really important. And, and knowing why you're doing what you're doing, so much of it, piriformis is intrapelvic anyways. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we, we have a way of putting people through certain tests to even determine the involvement of the deep six 
um, which, you know, one of the great things about the assessment that we do is that peer formist doesn't necessarily show up any more than, you know, one of the operator muscles or one of the gemellus uh, muscles. I mean, it, and it's really cool to be able to like have this sort of like sniper ability to, to dive in there and be like, oh, you know, that butt cheek awareness you have, it's not piriformis, it's actually one of the other deep six muscles. I don't know why piriformis like rose to this claim to fame um, that it seems to have, but, and it's not to say that it's never a problem either, but a good assessment will tell you when to go there. And, you know, when we actually do address piriformis, it's not through digging in that tissue. Um, it's not through, you know, aggravating any of those structures that are coming out of that greater sciatic notch. It's through, you know, kind of what we just talked about in the last discussion through pendulums and, and, you know, and through the, the stability isometrics and things like that. Um, there are very, very clear tests that we utilize to be able to know when to get off of a structure because knowing when to leave a structure is just as important as knowing when to hone in on it. So um, I, I, I really love that about the, some of the ID2 assessments because there's so much myth busting involved and, and you know, why you're actually going for a certain set of tissues. And, and hopefully the person that's trying to get out of awareness isn't putting more awareness back into it just because of a technique that sort of misses the mark a little bit and, and starts to just bring a lot of afferents to an area. It's not like we're trying to get rid of those techniques either. We're no, just, of course not. Yeah, I, I love that you said that, Anna. It's not that putting a gigantic needle through your butt, like we, were, we went to the, the same acupuncture school, and, and mm -hmm. I remember them to GB30. You, you, you often talk about in the coursework, you know, four to five inch needle. And I remember both of our eyes moving out of our skulls when we were told yeah. that. Like, we were like, wait a minute. What? <laughs> it's it, it's about femoral centration. Piriformis is not a force generator. If it was a force mm -hmm. generator, it would cross more joints. Mm -hmm. It's a joint centrator trying to position where you are in space. And if you have not seen Dr. Anna Folkmer and I demonstrate <laughs> joint centration versus versus you have, we'll save that for the idealists that come to the courses or, or watch the online work. <laughs> it's hilarious. But but I think that people. Uh, they think that piriformis is everything that's in the butt cheek and they don't understand the difference between force generation and joint centration and they don't understand that a lot of what people are feeling around that butt is neurovascular compression and neurogenic inflammation. They're not necessarily feeling piriformis. They'll call everything fascia. They'll say, oh, I'm feeling fascial constriction and fascia, fascia, fascia. And I'm like, hold the phone. Nothing against fascia. But fascia is a slave to blood and it's a slave to nerves. And if you create neurovascular compression, you better believe you're going to have fascial constriction. So I, I'm not going to buy that fascia is stopping me as a sole entity. You better think about fascia and blood and nerves and muscles and bones, and you better appreciate all of them. And I, I think that's what I love about ID so much is that um, it gives you standard operating system again, a flow chart, know where to start and that fascia will, will very quickly accommodate. It will not take time. That Those muscles also will quickly accommodate. Because Anna says a lot, you are not fragile. Right. <laughs> Stop thinking that you're fragile. Oh my gosh, I can't do my, my stuff unless I do a 30-minute mobility sequence first. If you need a 30-minute mobility sequence first, there is a problem. Because you, you need to, to look at how your body is completing said workout, completing said walk to work, run uh, for your competitive event, whatever. But um, we are not a slave to fascia. We are not a slave to anything but motor control and, and really good stability. And not that fascia is not part of it, it absolutely is, but it is not a sole entity. And, and that rustles a lot of people's feathers because fascia is finally getting like the the credit that it may deserve of not being a waste disposal tissue in the anatomy lab, but it also is being focused on so much that people are forgetting that fascia is a slave to blood, to nerves. Please don't ever forget it. And you saw all the nerves and arteries and veins that Danny drew coming out of just the greater sciatic notch. We didn't even include the lesser sciatic notch. We didn't include various other blood vessels that are around that area. So please know that a lot of what you're feeling in that butt cheek may be neurovascular compression, uh, neurovascular compression and possibly even neurogenic inflammation, which is at the root of a lot of people's nociception, a lot of pain reception. Well, and also too, the, the ambiguity of a lot of the research, the EMG studies on those deep six muscles, like support 
this whole idea of it being a joint centrator anyway. It's because it's so the, the depth of it and, you know, just the sort of that, that layering of all of the tissue in your butt um, kind of like brings it down on the priority list a little bit from, from an awareness perspective, but kind of bring, bumps it up on the priority list in terms of a, a joint centration perspective, because there's a lot of the debate and the, the um, research that, you know, it's like, well, what are these things actually doing? Well, they're, they're, they're joint centrators. And so, you know, when you're bringing some of these mobility um, uh, drills to something that's really just there to kind of help stabilize you, it, again, it, it becomes this issue of like your, your problem, the, the answer to your problem and your actual problem don't totally line up. And so now you're just kind of talking back and forth at something rather than just getting in there and getting the job done. Yeah, the problem with the fact that when you have awareness in your butt, do you, how do you know if it's neurogenic inflammation? How do you know if it's not, uh, nerves are very bloodthirsty. How do you know that it's not, uh, you're wanting to move through space just to get some blood going to an area? Yeah. How, how do you know how to stop and limit that to where you don't traction the nerve and actually create neuritis and, and, and even neuropathy? Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen so many patients that are stretching into their neuropathies. Uh, and uh, if you don't have an assessment process, then you're not going to know. And what immaculate dissection we're very proud to give you is a standard operating system and assessment process to know what to do. Uh, Danny, do you have anything to add about that absolutely gorgeous animation you did on why not everything in your butt is piriformis? Well, what we're kind of saying in terms of that much though, uh, just uh, if you're constantly foam rolling there and constantly putting pressure in there, that pressure is going to override the pain pathways. So it, it might give you that, that immediate, like that immediate kind of relief and whatnot. And it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, the way I was kind of thinking about it though, is like, it's like taking out like a high interest loan, uh, that could easily be solved by, by, by redistributing the funds kind of whatnot, you know? Oh, so, like, so, what a great so, analogy, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's one of those things, that it's, it's giving an immediate, like, immediate relief in the moment, but it's not fixing the problem at all. And as, mm -hmm. you know, Kathy and Anna were saying, like, you start compressing these things, you can start getting neuropathy, you can start getting, you know, uh, blood constriction, so on and so forth, and that's just going to make your problem way worse as time goes on. I love it, Danny. That, that's such a huge point. I love the, the high yeah, it's so <laughs> relevant <laughs> credit card debt. Maybe your foam roller is credit card debt. Um, one, of the, one of the questions we had uh, that I thought was really, really great, uh, and maybe the last question for tonight because we're we're getting close to the hour, um, was um, the knee, like tightness around the knee. Mm -hmm. And they asked us, like, when when something is tight around the knee, how do you know where to start? And uh, just you know, to be a broken record again, like we often are in immaculate dissection, where do you start at the flow chart? Um, Danny, you created an absolutely gorgeous piece of art to show all the things that cross the knee. And I wanted to pull that up in a screen share for everyone to visualize. So Danny did this just before this meeting because he is a rock star. Um, <laughs> he was like, be right back, give me 10 minutes. <laughs> And like, we're like, like oh, yeah. and he's like, can you have us visualize this? And he was like, no, yeah. <laughs> I can make it better than like even like enviable to Da Vinci in in like right. Get me like ten. Uh, <laughs> Danny works so hard at at uh, like Anna and I will talk about concepts that that we really want to include in immaculate dissection, and then Danny's there going, oh, I can make that really really visible, and we're like, how the heck? <laughs> and he makes it, makes it way prettier than it is in the lab, which is why our course is called Immaculate Protection. It's way better. You go to the lab, you are not going to see this differentiation. No way. Which is so helpful when you're trying to visualize what's happening. Um, the whole point of this picture was to show you how many things cross the knee. So you see vastus medialis, rectus femoris, vastus intermedius, uh, vastus lateralis. He's got uh, uh, gracilis um, sartorius, uh, tensor fasciolata gluteus maximus, uh, gastrocnemius plantaris. He's probably hidden somewhere underneath this mess. Poplidius, um, semimem uh, here, semiten. Uh, look at the massive amount of structures that cross the knee. And most of our patients come in and will say, oh, well, I think I got that medial meniscus problem that's going around. <laughs> it's a massive amount of structures across the knee. So in, in immaculate dissection, the way that we analyze the knee tightness, the first thing we hear when we hear knee tightness is clear them for a core stability problem, mm -hmm. right? Which is what we always do in immaculate dissection because of the trickle down effect that Danny was talking about, right? Uh, do that. And then if you have the right to do, you know, our, our, the rest of our lower extremity assessment, we look at our lower extremity assessment on whether or not something that crosses the knee is a driver of dysfunction or whether or not the dysfunction is more at the hip. 
right? And so we, we can detect an immaculate dissection within 30 seconds if something is a core stability problem or if it is a unilateral you know, knee or below driver, which we call foot driver, since the tibia is involved with the talocrural joint, is the, is the foot the driver or the, or the hip the driver? Which is really important with knee pain because as Danny talked about, and Anna talked about, the, the side of pain is not always the source of it. And, and that's an important concept. It could be, and it could not be. Um, not to dismiss pain, it's just that pain is a subjective experience that we cannot trust as a, an objective practitioner. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't care. It's just that you have to not let it guide you too much. It's like, oh, this person has knee pain. If the pain is associated with tightness, then I'm concerned that that tightness may be involved with, you know, something that I can help them change in this immediate future with pendulums. And, uh, and we can do it pretty quick. But before you get quick, you have to get knowledgeable. And in the words of one of our teaching team members, Dr. Monica Chetta, she says, you have to first get complicated by under you have to understand everything that Danny just showed us crossing the knee what it does it's clinical pearls and how it shows up in clinical assessment and that's the only way to make it simple so if you dive in with us with a full support system with the three co-founders our teaching team we're we're on standby ready to help you answer those questions but we are going to be unforgiving in the fact that we're going to make you follow the same standard operating system that we do and that there, there's not going to be any quick and easy answers without following that flowchart. And what we find is that most of the students answer their own questions, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. We want you to feel open to ask them. But when it comes to knee tightness, what's our first question be? Is a core stability problem? Is it a lower extremity problem driven by the foot or the hip? I'm not going to just going to say, oh, I got that medial meniscus problem going around. I, I don't know if that's true because I know that 75% of that meniscus is avascularized and not really has a, has a ton of sensory information to it that likely way before the meniscus created you know faulty mechanoreception up to the parietal lobe way before that happened muscles failed yeah. you know and so we have to, to look at the relationships of how we can take tension off of something so it stops sending that dysfunctional uh pathway up uh anna you want to piggyback on that I, I... That was really articulate. I'm oh, honestly, sorry. I no, no. I, I, I mean, I'm coming off. I'm sorry. I guess you know, with the the assessment, um, it's always really great to to just be proven wrong, right? Like you know, it's it, it it's there's something so humbling about your own kind of biases and and confirmation biases and stuff like that because I can look at something and think. I bet I know what that is. And then I put them through an assessment and then like, well, well that proved me wrong. There you go. It's actually this. And I, I actually love that. You know, I love finding out that the problem was actually on the other limb or, yeah. you know, something like that. And, and, and with knee tightness, you know, we're going to, it, you always say that you know, no one gets the pass. Like there, there isn't going to ever be a situation that walks in class or that walks in our offices that doesn't, that bypasses assessment. I mean, it's just, you know, knee tightness, hip tightness, foot tightness, toe tightness, whatever. It, it's still going to go through the same exact standard operating system so that you go exactly to where the problem is. And, you know, don't, it, it sounds so oversimplified, but the knee, the next door neighbors of the knee are the hip and the foot. So you have to clear them, right? They share bones. They, you know, you can't, you can't look at one in this sort of micro way that's, you know, you get to be holistic about it and take this step back and look at the person as a whole and understand where in their story does the knee tightness come up? Um, and, and where does it fall in that line? And your assessment will tell you exactly where. And, and it just really does become this sort of foolproof thing where you get to understand a part of their story and why their subjective experiences um, are what they are. And it's, it's not that they aren't important. Of course, they're important. But if we only go by that, we're going to sort of miss all of these other moving parts that are, you know, going to ultimately be the thing that puts you right exactly where you need to be. So it's that ability to understand almost immediately, like you said, within 30 seconds of 
where, you know, why this person is experiencing what they're experiencing. And it's, it's a, it's a really cool thing to have some insight into and, and to be able to share with them because it always makes sense to them. And then you can film it and you can show it to them and they're like, Oh my God, I have no idea what's doing that. And, and, you know, then they're thinking about it and they're super stimulated by it. And then they're, you just see like light bulb, light bulb, blah, 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 and you know, all these connecting of all the dots and stuff. And, and, um, and it really sort of changes their relationship to pain management as a whole. And that's, you know, I, I think that that, that, that just, it's, it's a very satisfying thing to be able to, to give to somebody. I love it. And I love that you talked about the functional painful knee. Like yeah. when, when somebody has like, like knee pain, but not necessarily tightness. And then you do your standard operating system with ID and find out the problems on the other side, <laughs> like the yeah. like dysfunctional, non-painful side that's tight. But the knee was getting killed because it was taking two thirds of the body weight pressure and that the, the load wasn't shared again right. on the other side. And that's something that we're really into at ID. I love it. Danny, do you have anything to add on that? Like, uh, like the knee comes up a lot for us in immaculate dissection two lower extremity concepts. Yeah. I mean, I'd say the big addition that would basically put into that much though, is just like, again, you guys saw how many structures were crossing the knee there, how many, how many things are going there. And it can be super overwhelming just trying trying to think of what each structure is doing, what each structure is contributing, so on and so forth. But through the assessments, it's able to break those down into everything above the knee, everything below the knee. And then from there, you can focus, you can cut down those numbers drastically. So that way there, it'll kind of give more of like a, as you know, term mentioned beforehand, just more of like a, a sniper scope as to where to fire and where to hit. And then through through the standard operating systems, through knowing the the, pr the progression of, of, uh, of assessments to make, matching with clinical pearls, matching with things that are lining up, it'll basically knock out targets to basically uh, fire sniper fire on and, and, and address properly. I love that. Like, I, I always imagine, like, me as a beginning practitioner, like, just throwing in a dartboard blindfolded and hoping that I hit it. And now I, I feel with immaculate dissection skill set that I can just hit the bullseye nearly every time <laughs> it's just the more you know about functional anatomy the more that that you learn the id flows and the way that we do things it, it makes everything that you're doing more usable faster quicker more to the point and it's a lot of it's just through understanding anatomy better and uh if it's been i mean it was my worst board score if you're freaked out by it we've all been freaked out by it. I know Danny was, I know Anna was, all three of us. I think we have that commonality and we still, the three of us study all the time. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> we're studying we constantly. Trudged through that storm together. <laughs> I love that, you know, new practitioner Dooley is only visualizing darts and new practitioner Anna was actually using darts in the form of <laughs> <laughs> Like this should work. <laughs> <laughs> the world of dry needling. If it's tight, put the needle in it and hope for the best. Uh, ah. I, I think ah. that there's only going to go so far until right. it's actually right. possibly the hard way only once. So it's not just foam rollers, folks. It's right. you know, cross balls and needles and chiropractic adjustments. Uh, you know, I admit I stretched things that were tight and they had no business being stretched. And sometimes they were around nerves and and, and creating really? like neurovascular compression. It was only when you know, I, I learned how to shorten things up with pendulums and, 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 and confine the movement to a dual range. And that's when a lot of that restriction went away and, and blood was able to flow, nerves were able to flow, and everything is in a, a yin and yang balance, if you will. Right. It, it, it's powerful stuff to, to learn about yourself and then apply it to a client situation. And we had a lot of great results. Yeah. I mean, I work, I work with, uh, share a couple of pages with Dr. Folkmer. And holy moly, they come back to me sometimes. They're like, Dr. Folkmore told me to do this. And I was like, she is right. <laughs> and I love it. I'm like, that's what I would have found. And, and it's just so nice to have, you know, standard operating systems and, and, you know, to work with colleagues that, oh, they did that. Of course they did that. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how I feel anytime I work with Dr. Folkmer, which is just phenomenal. And I, I feel that way about other ID practitioners that they're like, oh, well, this person gave me this correction for my breathing. And I'm like, they were right. It just gets me really excited to, to work with the idealists and then hopefully idealists will start to spread like wildfire. Uh, the more people will, will take the coursework and teach it, you know, to their, their clients and, and, and get results faster. So we hope that you guys uh, enjoy this first round of Ask Us Anything from the ID co-founders. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate the, the live participants. Thank you so much for your awesome questions. And I think that we hit 
uh, on everything for the most part. And uh, if not, send us some, some comments and we'll hit it for the next Ask Us Anything. If, if, we, if you guys feel this was useful, then I know that we can convince Anna and Danny and I to, to come back and do another one soon. I mean, <laughs> we're there. This is the cool thing about having a little bit of free time, right? We can get yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I don't. I can't think of, of two people I like more than than Anna and Danny, other than my husband and dogs. So th these two people are people I want to hang out with all the time. So if you guys give us an excuse to hang out, we're gonna take it. Yeah, we really do have too much fun together. So <laughs> this is like we. <laughs> There's no convincing needed. <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> if you want to get a taste, of, uh, more of a taste of what we do, uh, check out www.maculadissection.com. We just, uh, not quite a month ago, right, guys? It, I think it was one month ago, just shy of a month ago, we released our online coursework, which mm -hmm. is our recorded courses, and they're 300 USD a piece. You can go on immaculatedissection.com and there's ID one, two, three, four, five, six. One is core concepts, two is lower, three is upper, four is neck jaw, hand and grip, five is peripheral nerve entrapment, and six is anatomy of movement subsystems based upon the volumes of systems. And uh, all, all courses are pretty popular in their, their relative realm and you can start anywhere at each of them. You, if you're really interested in neck, you can start at four. If you're super interested in core, you start at one, you're not required to start or finish in any place. Some people like to go one, two, three, four, five, six, but it really is not necessary. It's whatever floats your boat. And that $300 that you invest in online courses, that can be applied as a deposit towards an in-person course at any time. So you don't lose that. You could take that 300 tuition and apply it to any in-person course in the future with no expiration date. We're, we're not, you know, we're, we're trying to get you learning this possibly while you're doing telehealth appointments. We have ID study groups on telehealth appointments. We, we really want to help our community be able to implement these skills. What a better time to do some continuing education than when you are on lockdown. This is perfect. Uh, this is a perfect time for you to, to learn our system. Uh, if you decide that you prefer the in-person, you know, we, we'd love to see you hopefully at the uh, mid to end of 2020, if not 2021. And remember that, that online tuition, if you want to start now, you can just apply it later to an in-person course, which we really would love that for you. Um, folks, do you, do you have any other questions? Like Anna, do you have anything to add before we leave? Uh, no, I, I, I uh, Camelia just asked what telehealth was. So I just typed that in the, in the chat box. It's an online appointment. So it's, it's the, um, you know, one of the things that, especially right now, you know, for hands-on practitioners to be able to maintain your, you know, with your clients and stuff, maintain your client load and your, your clinical load with um, yeah, these online assessments is, is phenomenal. You can put somebody through the same exact ID assessments that we learn in the seminars. You can take the class online, learn the assessments, and then keep up with your practice all from your own home. And it's great. <laughs> so, so you know, yeah, your, your, your clients miss you, you know, and it's not just uh, about maintaining your practice. Of course, it's about that, but it's also about, you know, helping people who may be, you know, working in different positions at home or doing, you know, different activities at home and things like that. So to be able to still have that availability um, and effectiveness as a practitioner from your own home, you know, this is a great way to sort of make sure that you can maintain that. Absolutely. And, and if, if you are low on income right now because of the, the pandemic, what you can do too, and we every single day we post a new video on our Instagram and on our Facebook page, Immaculate Dissection, and uh, you can just learn some concepts for free every day. Uh, just come, tune in and learn something new from us. We we would love to answer your questions and and guide you as much as we can. And and we understand the difficulty of the situation. If you have the the you know the finances to be able to invest in yourself right now by doing an online course, we do suggest it because we also have an online forum on Facebook for that's private to our idealists to ask us questions at any time. And, and, and we're right there. I, I check that, you know, a minimum twice daily morning, night minimum. And, and hopefully you can ask any questions and we're going to guide you back to the flow chart, guide you back to the pendulum, answer some things for you. Uh, hopefully you guys can, uh, can join us. Danny, do you have anything to add before we uh, end? I mean, just uh, just thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, being a part of the ED debut, uh, Ask Us Anything, and uh, hope hope can see a few more of you guys in the, in the ID community. <laughs> Wonderful. 
If we did not get to your, your question tonight, just make sure to shoot me an email at drkathydooley at gmail.com or immaculatedissection at gmail.com. Uh, we'll collect the questions and then we'll try to cover it for the next Ask Us Anything. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the talk tonight. This will be up on YouTube tomorrow, so I will share that on our Immaculate Dissection Facebook page, so you'll see it there. So hopefully you'll follow us there and you'll be able to, to watch back this talk as many times as you want. Uh, thank you all for joining us from remotely and, uh, and also from your amazing questions beforehand. We really appreciate your interest and we hope you join our idealist family. Until then, thank you so much and we'll see you on the Immaculate Dissection pages. All right, thanks guys. Thanks.